scientists. We are politicians. We are the experts. We are your leaders. We rule over you. Do not question what we have told you. Do not trust your senses, the five senses which you have will ultimately lead you to question us and that cannot be acceptable, that cannot be tolerated. Do not trust your five senses. If there is anything that we need you to understand about us. It is this. We despise him. We do not want him anywhere here. He is not welcomed in this world. We hate him. And we will do whatever we can to fight against him. We are the scientists. We are the ones who rule over you. I am Robbie Davidson, and for as long as I can remember, finding and knowing the truth has been important to me. So about two years ago, I started to discover that there were fundamental ideas about our world that were being presented as scientific realities that had not been proven in the least. As a Christian, I felt a strong sense of responsibility to research, discover, scrutinize, and share what I had learned. So I thought it best to introduce you to some of the people I've learned from on my quest. Many whom are scientists, but also others who are regular people like you and me, who are dedicated, willing to do the work necessary to uncover the falsehoods that have been propagated in the name of science. Not true science that requires strict methodology. What we have been subject to is not science at all, but scientism. So why do we accept their conclusions? Are scientists the new gods? Not to be questioned? Beyond reproach? Is it because we are not scientists ourselves? We didn't do the experiments. We didn't look up the results. We didn't analyze the data. We simply assumed that because scientists said so, it must be. What I'm aiming to do along with the people I will introduce you to in this documentary is to shine the light in the darkness, to see that scientism has been masquerading all along as the truth. Science, in its pure form, is a humbling experience by which people can learn they are not gods, and the truth is a value higher than themselves. So if what we have before us is a deliberate deception and a larger agenda, then we are in a battle for the truth. And this is the next chapter.
Scientism exposed to. It might come as a surprise to most people that one of the most dangerous worldviews one can hold is scientism. The failing of science is not really about the scientific method. It is about a largely unrecognized epistemology that developed as a result of the successes of science. This faulty epistemology can be called scientism, and we should make a sharp distinction between science and scientism. Today, all we have is speculation upon speculation upon speculation where hypothesis somehow manages to graduate to theory. Theory is accepted as fact, and all you do is add more ad hoc theory to support the thing that you're calling fact. It's still nothing more than really a hypothesis. It's never been proven. Scientism is an attack on the Bible. Again, <clears throat> to say that the earth is millions of years old says that, that the, the, if you add up the ages of, of the men of the Bible, and you only get 6,000 years, they're saying that's untrue, but that's what's there. They're saying the Word of God can't be true. It can't be inspired because we're saying the earth is 10,000 or 100,000 or a million years old. So that's not true. The Bible says that God created all things in six days, resting on the seventh. Scientism is saying, no, no, no. Uh, it all got created out of dust out here that sort of came together with a will of its own and formed everything. So everything they say contradicts the Bible. In the Bible, we are unique and extremely special. We have a purpose, we have a function, there's a meaning to our life. And in the scientism model, you have no meaning, no function, you're a, you're a fortunate accident, you know, of random mutation over millions of years in a pale blue dot around an average sun in an average galaxy, you know, or in a, in a backwater wing of an average galaxy amongst billions of galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. The message is you are insignificant. If the information continues to be controlled by scientism, uh, meaning that the, the narrative is controlled, then I think you're going to see um, uh, that, that God is totally excluded out of, uh, out of society, out of culture. Why? Because it's already, it's already been done to some extent uh, by other various means. And by controlling the narrative, you have to control the youth. And by controlling the youth, you have to control education. And when you control the education of young minds, then you can change the doctrine, then you can change the mindset to say, you know what, this next generation coming up, they're, gonna, they're not gonna have any knowledge of what true science is. Why? Because they're not being taught how to think they're being taught what to think. That's not science at all, that's scientism. It's a huge attack because the God of the Bible tells us exactly. He says, in the beginning, God created or He created the heavens and the earth. And He tells you exactly how He did it in the exact order. And certain things didn't happen until day four, but yet we say that it is. So, you know, the spinning uh, model that we have is nowhere to be found in that narrative. But if you attack that narrative and show it as to be false, and you say your science disproves that narrative, then you diminish God. You move people away from God, and you can give them another God, whether it's ancient aliens, whether it's science itself, whether it's humanism, you know, pagan beliefs, whatever. You can replace the truth with error, and people will buy it because the science tells us this is true. I believe there's an agenda with scientism for sure because of the repeating pattern of the conclusions that they draw. Um, I know very, uh, very smart Christian scientists that have to keep their mouth closed because if you were to offer anything other than the mainstream secular position, they're shut down, they're ostracized, they are thrown out of academia, um, they're denied tenure. And when you see that sort of attack, on a person's point of view, followed by 
mainstream conclusions that are always 180 degrees in opposition to a biblical standpoint or Christianity as a whole, that is a repeating pattern that I cannot ignore. Science is supposed to be about observation and collecting the data and repeating the tests. And so when you actually go and do those things, it's frowned upon by the establishment still, or, or I should say the indoctrination system, because it, truly that's what it is. I mean, you're being indoctrinated. You have to answer the questions a certain way or you're gonna get an F. I believe the topic of exposing scientism is so important. I've said this many times, but scientism is like a Trojan horse. It's moved in where people look at it as fact and reality. It's moved right in. It said, oh, we're against religion. But scientism is nothing but a religion. They want the separation. You always hear about the war, science versus religion, right? It's scientism versus God, that's what's going on. I've heard these people say that they are glad that many people are ignorant and stupid because it allows them to perpetrate their lies. But when you start researching them and calling them out and doing your own research, their lies, their propaganda, it no longer works. Propaganda only works if you're ignorant and go with the emotion. Propaganda does not work if you are informed and you know the truth. This is important because it's propaganda that we are fighting. Truly evil, demonic, strong propaganda that is leading you into this strong delusion and they're building this illusion on scientism versus science. Scientism is simply religious beliefs clothed in scientific terms. We will restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonder. Scientism exposes all about exposing scientism for what it is. Theories, theory of relativity, and theory of evolution. We're gonna meet up with Dr. Aaron Jenkins. We're gonna learn about his excavations. We're gonna learn about his journey on the top of Mount Ararat, looking for the evidence of Noah's flood, the ark, some exciting stuff. Just incredible to be able to talk to someone that's actually traveled the world realize that this stuff's going on and yet they're trying to hide it they're trying to hide they're trying to hide the true creator of creation you got to believe that my first stop was glen rose texas to interview dr aaron judkins as an archaeologist he has traveled all over the world exploring and uncovering many fascinating things dr judkins has a reputation as an unorthodox adventurer because he refuses to accept what has become common knowledge a true scientist his discoveries have shaken the lies of scientism. He would take me to the place where dinosaur tracks and human footprints were found in the same sediment layer. I could see with my own eyes that these impressions were not millions of years old, a notion that completely goes against the mainstream science narrative. It would be a day I would never forget. My last excavation was in Qumran. We found that the uh, we excavated K53, which which is uh, uh, probably the 12th Dead Sea Scroll cave. 
that's been found wow. in, um, in over 60 years. We were the first team to excavate in Qumran um, in, in over 60 years. And uh, we found new Dead Sea Scroll material culture. So we're walking down here towards the Pluxy River here in Glen Rose, Texas. We're gonna make a hard left here and walk down to the river. These dinosaur tracks are in Cretaceous limestone, which according to the theory of evolution is dated at 110 million years old. And so you still see this dinosaur track here. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna walk down this way, but this dinosaur track is walking right through here, right along the edge of where we're standing on this platform right down through this way. This is his stride, so this is, would be one track here. This would be the next stride right here. And then this is the next one right here. And then this one's kind of under some mud and he keeps walking this way. These tracks, the, the erosion rate should be five foot down. And we see that these tracks are still here and they're not eroded five foot down. If the erosion rates were true, uh, going back millions of years, these tracks should be disappeared millions of years ago, mm -hmm. but they're not. Mm -hmm. There should be an erosion level of five feet. It should totally obliterate the tracks, but it doesn't. Why? Because these tracks are much more recent. This is a great example of a track that's got water in it. You can really see the definition. They're theropod, meaning they're three-toed. So the left digit, the middle digit, mm -hmm. you can see kind of where the claw marking mm -hmm. is here. Mm -hmm. And then you got the right digit, the back of the heel here. Mm -hmm. And so just a little bigger than my hand, about mm -hmm. the size of your hand. Mm -hmm, yeah. Every year we open this up to the public for annual excavations, for families, for kids, for um, high school kids, college kids, adults. They can all come and they can participate in original excavations for dinosaur tracks. Um, this is one of the only places, one of the few places in the world that you can do this. So it's a really a unique opportunity mm -hmm. to come excavate. So as we continue this week, we will bring you up-to-date information on the excavations here on the Poxy River, the year 2012 in Glen Rose, Texas. Most paleontology professors have taught in the classroom has never excavated one dinosaur track. Really? My son's probably got more field experience than those guys do. But my role was really, um, if this was authentic, then original excavation should show that there's no way that this could be carved. Mm -hmm. And so really the only way to know is to excavate under these ledges right. and do the work and the labor exactly. and find you out for, that. you can't that. fake this. No. I mean, this is so hard, this is all limestone. I realize that, man, this is really, this is, yeah. this, this is real. On the same layer that we're standing on now is uh, the human fossil footprints have been found. It's been highly controversial, Robbie, because dinosaurs and man are supposed to be separated by 65 million years. Is this isolated to Glen Rose or is there other footprints found around the world? And it turns out uh, this is not an isolated phenomenon unique to Glen Rose on a little river in Texas. This is found in a lot of other places around the world. The expert uh, said they look human, they match the human morphology, but they go, oh, we gotta, we gotta, you know, they're, they're in rock 3.6 yeah. million years old, so yeah. they can't be human. So they, they say, well, we're gonna have to reclassify this. Well, it doesn't work with the evolution narrative. No, even the Bible talks about the dragons. In Job chapter 40, God's talking to Job and he says, behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eats grass like an ox. His uh, tail is like a cedar tree. He drinks up the river Jordan. His, his bones are like brass. He is the chief of the ways of God. And God is telling Job, he said, look at this creature that I made with you. And he goes out of his way to tell Job, I made this creature with you. Look how majestic he is. Can you describe him? Now the description of behemoth is a big seropod dinosaur. However, the commentators will tell you, well, it's probably a hippo or an elephant, but they didn't look at the tail. Yeah. See, God says it has a tail of a big cedar tree, not like an elephant or a hippo. I think this is more descriptive of a big seropod dinosaur. You know, I know my kids growing up loved dinosaurs. They were all about dinosaurs, you know. 
Why? Because it was fascinating and prehistoric, right? But that plays into evolution. Scientism and evolution. I'm a scientist, I don't know any evidence against evolution. I mean, of course, evolution was a doozy, you know, for this generation. I mean, even in generations before Darwin and before um, NASA and before Copernicus and the heliocentric lie, even before that, the attacks was always, it was always upon the Word of God to try to get people either away from it or to corrupt it in some way or come up with their own translations and bring in false stuff. I mean, that, you know, that's been the goal. I mean, just. Just like Satan did in, in the garden, it's always been, what has God said? You know, yeah, you know what God told you, but let me, let me explain it for you. Let me clarify, let me add to it. Let me help you out, Eve. Did God say, did God say that he created? Did God say that he created everything in six days? Did God say that everything was uh, for him and by him and he saw everything that was good? Doesn't the heavens testify to the glory of God? In Romans uh, 121, it says that, that um, the heavens testify to the, to the glory of God and to the things that are made that are clearly seen, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. No wonder this is a critical point in our culture of scientism versus um, creation versus evolution. Why is this important? Because it matters what we believe. And when it matters what you believe, you have to ask yourself, why do you believe what you believe? Is it because you were raised in the West? Is it because your mom and dad told you? Is it because a scientist told you? Or is it because you believe the evidence? Is it because you also have a measure of faith, whether that measure of faith is through the, 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 the story of, of Genesis and the Bible and how things came to origin, or it's the story by faith of evolution? This is the central question. And when you expose scientism, the science, the real science, the real data, the real empirical evidence points to an intelligent design that screams out, the creation is screaming out. There's a design and there's a designer behind that. There are some lies in our science books. Taught it for 15 years. I think little bits and pieces of evolution should be taught in schools because it is a theory. And after all, we all need to know about different theories so that we can figure out what we want to believe is true. I do feel that evolution shouldn't be taught in school just because there's so many different, different views on it, so many different definitions. Like, how do you te te teach a child the true meaning of evolution when so many different cultures have their different beliefs and scientists have their different theories? Really, there are two big claims of modern evolutionary theory as a scientific theory. The first is common ancestry. Everything goes back to one universal common ancestor. So human beings, we don't just share an ancestor, say, with chimps. We share an ancestor with fungi. You know, everything goes back to one uh, common ancestor. The second claim is that the primary engine of how evolution took place was a blind, undirected process of natural selection acting on random variations in nature. So really it's an unguided, blind, purposeless process. And that really was Darwin's view. In the ordinary language sense of the word fact, evolution is a fact. If you say the word science, that's it. That's just, it's kind of like, we've observed it, we've tested it, we've proved it again and again and again, and so it's science is settled. Well, on some things, but theoretical physics, the theories of the origin of the universe, the origin of life, 
These are things that cannot be proven, they cannot be tested, they cannot be observed. So these are, these are theories and their belief systems, their worldview. You, you begin to realize that it's, it's just, it's, it's a religion. True science and scientism as a counterfeit uh, made up theology because it is a religion. And once you understand that the preponderance of it, the perpetuation of it is built upon lies and that it is a matrix of deceit, then seeing through all of that, understanding that the, the Bible is the authority and that the cosmology put forth within the scriptures is the truth of where we are with regard to the creation and also the creator, that understanding it is the truth, then you can push away the lies and then come to understanding that um, and then go seeking forth the, the truth of who we are, where we are, and what all this is really about again. I think Satan would use uh, something like scientism to deceive people because who could go check it out? Can the average person is, you know, he hasn't seen a, a microscope since high school. He can't go dig up a bone. He wouldn't know what to do with it if he did. He can't research stuff. He's got a job to do. You know, he's not a freelance writer or a freelance artist. He's got to stay on that job or he gets fired. So the average person just, they can't look into the claims of scientists. They bring it into the school system, and the school system says, now if you don't answer this the way we say, you won't get your degree, therefore you won't be teaching, your life's gonna be a waste. So, okay, I don't believe it, but I'll, I'll go ahead and teach it. That's why we're in the mess we're in today. I will not sell out the truth of the Bible just so I can get a paycheck from my local school or the university. I've come all the way to make a PhD, and they won't let me get it because I won't, I won't make one more lie. And so that scraps my whole PhD program. Yay for you. I wish somebody would do that. But, you know, it's the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, that's the love of money. I want that money the university is going to give me for telling this story that's not true. Well, shame on you. So let's talk about Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who worked for Jack Horner, was a scientist who um, thought, you know what, let's cut open the dinosaur bone. Let's saw it and see what's inside of this thing. And so she did and she t uh, took a T-Rex bone, she cut it in very thin slices, and she put it in solution um, and over several weeks. And then when she looked at it under the microscope, something very astounding happened. She realized that she was seeing soft, pliable tissue, elastic tissue. She also found red blood cells, unfossilized red blood cells, and dinosaur bone that's supposedly 65 million years old. So what does Dr. Mary Schweitzer do? Well, she does what any good scientist would do, right? She does the scientific method. She repeats the process. She tries to predict the outcome. Uh, she tests it. And, um, and then, you know, more importantly, you try to falsify the data. And so she repeats the test multiple times, multiple times. She realizes that she's getting the same results. Unfossilized, soft elastic tissue, fresh red blood cells, and dinosaur bone that's unfossilized, that's supposedly 65 million years old. And how does that happen? If that dinosaur is that old, if that dinosaur goes back to the Jurassic 65 million years ago, why isn't that stuff fossilized? So Dr. Mary Swatcher says, this is important. This is something we haven't seen in paleontology before. Let, let's show this to the world. Let me show this to the, my peers and let me present it in a publication, and she did. And at first everyone was like, wow, this is great. This really kind of rocked the paleontology world in the, in the field of academics because they didn't quite understand. They've never seen anything like this before. And now they had to, they had to think, wait a minute, the implications of, of what she found is more serious than we thought because this means that maybe these dinosaurs aren't really 65 million years old after all. If they are, the question remains, why isn't that fossilized through and through? When you have the evidence to say, this is why I believe in creation. This is why I think scientism is wrong in these areas. Although there are good scientists out there, there are good academics doing good research like Dr. Mary Schweitzer and, and others. But when you have scientism thrown into the mix, then you understand that there is an agenda 
We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to expose that. We're going to leave that. We're going to leave that alone. We're not going to talk about soft tissues and dinosaur bones. We're just going to leave that alone. And by the way, if you publish that, we're going to force you to 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 recant that, because after all, this is your career. This is what you do, right? And if you're earning an income and a paycheck, and this is what you do, well, you're going to fall in line. So the, the standard is fall in line, or you're out. And when something conflicts with their, with their, uh, with their viewpoint, when something conflicts with that belief system, man, they'll defend it at all costs. Matter of fact, evolution is really the only theory that's defended by law. The theory of evolution, like the theory of gravity, is a scientific fact. Why are you saying no? The only narrative that we can push in school is the scientism narrative. The, and you got people like, uh, I think it was Lawrence Krauss saying, look, to say that both curriculums should be taught, he said, you know, that the Earth is 6,000 years old and that it's 4.55 billion years old, which is what it is, he says. He says that's a, the equivalent of child abuse. That's child abuse. That's not education, that's indoctrination. A person should have the ability to look at multiple points of view, weigh the merits of them, test them out for themselves, and decide what is truth. I typed up a, um, a four-page report and sent it to the State Board of Education. Basically, it was my testimony in written form. And I said, why would you consider removing the phrase, uh, teaching the children strengths and weaknesses of evolution, when that's good science? Because otherwise, if you don't teach both sides of the argument, you're, you're teaching one side. You're teaching evolution as fact. And that really becomes indoctrination. And you're indoctrinating the kids with my tax dollars. So you're not teaching the kids science. Science should, should teach the kids how to think, how to critically think. It shouldn't teach them what to think. I headed to Crosbyton, Texas to meet the remarkable man behind the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. Joe Taylor is a passionate paleontologist who has spent much of his life exposing the lies of scientism. He has a strong commitment to see the true science put forward with the evidence that he has collected over the years. It was very hard to believe that the mainstream scientific community have dismissed much of what Joe Taylor's work has revealed. From looking through the fossil record, he showed me it only validates a biblical perspective and destroys the evolutionary narrative that has been broadly accepted. His clear evidence that supports a worldwide flood has been ignored. The approach of the science community is to sweep findings like Joe's under the rug. They cannot accept, they will not accept, and will do everything possible to keep truths hidden. Hello, Joe. Oh, Joe, I'm Robbie Davidson. Joe Taylor. Very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. There's a presumption that when someone says science, that, that, that when someone says they're a scientist, they immediately have credibility. And, and you don't know if they've made stupid conclusions or not. So they might look through a, a microscope, they might do a DNA test and all that. That doesn't mean they're telling you the whole story. You know, you can test, we, we had some bones tested or wood tested. One end was of, of a, a vastly different age than the other, side, the other end of the piece. Well then, what's true? We're gonna tell the kids of the late 1940s, they invented carbon dating. We're gonna explain a little bit about radiometric dating and how it's supposed to work, and then show you that it does not work, okay? It sounds good, but there are some assumptions that mess everything up. If we had walked into a room and found a candle burning on the table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know, Mr. Holman, it's burning when I got here. Okay, well then, let's do some empirical science. Let's measure the height of the candle. Suppose the candle is seven inches tall. Who can tell me when it was lit? Okay, nobody. Let's do some more empirical science. Let's measure the rate of burn. Suppose we determine it's burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You're gonna have a hard time telling me unless you're willing to make some assumptions. You find a fossil in the dirt. You can measure how much C14 is in it. Very accurately, by the way. And you can measure how fast it's decaying. That's just like measuring the height of your candle and how fast it's burning. Now, when did that animal die? You don't have a clue. Here's what you ought to consider about carbon dating. Samples of known age, it doesn't work. If it's a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. 
these are, it's just really a hard thing. It's, it's really a hard thing. Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. Living penguins, carbon dated 8,000 years old. I, I try to make three major points here. One is the, the rapid burial of most fossils, which says worldwide flood. If you know where they're buried, you know where they're buried under hundreds of feet of mud, it goes around the world, it has to be the, the flood. Giantism argues against everything starting off little bitty and getting more and more complex. So I have a lot of giant things in here to show that's just simply not true. And the complexity of things, even these old trilobites over here by the trillions, you know, if you know anything about them, you know they're extremely complex animals more than we are. These old salamanders over here they're supposed to have evolved from, they're more complex than we are. One of their teeth is more complex than all of our teeth. And they get hundreds in their life. So all that stuff, they, they pass that off now all these years is so, supposedly that science. Well, I'm just showing you, look, the real hard stuff, these bones disprove all that. Those tracks that shouldn't be there disprove your theory that things took a long time to build up. Well, it's good. I mean, it's great that there's people like you speaking out and <clears throat> providing, you know, locations such as this to, you know, expose the world's lies because there definitely is an agenda. There definitely is deceptions going on, you know, and when the evidence is presented, like I said, they don't want to hear it. Because again, this is taught to children from an early age. Yeah. And it basically, what I, the way I've looked at it is dinosaurs tell us our past based on the narrative. So it kind of secures that story with that deception, but it's, it's unbelievable how much evidence to support the fact that they're not millions of years old. No, and they're not extinct. Only God knows what's actually extinct. But you know, there's reports all the time. I had people in my museum. This lady told me her dad killed uh, one of these long neck things in, a, in an al or an allosaur type thing, and he saw under the long neck thing out in the, the Amazon jungle. Well, there's no reason to make that up. That actually happened. And there are other reports that come out all the time. Why aren't those taught in school? Why aren't they on the news all the time? Well, they come in the news and they, they cut them out because they don't want anybody to come along and saying dinosaurs are still alive. Well, that means it didn't go extinct. Well, that means man and dinosaurs live together. Yeah. Okay, so that wipes out evolution. This uh, is a, a cast of a sculpture I made. A professor at a, uh, asked me to make one based on a report from uh, a road construction guy in Egypt and Holmes and Uranzora. I made myself a cast and do a, did a drawing to fit this bone just to show how tall this guy would have been. His heels go down about six more inches, but his, uh, the bottom of his rib cage is coming to 9'3". So how tall was the man? Let's say he was at least 14 feet, maybe, maybe more. He's the same size as King Og in the Bible. So what's the problem? A lot of creationists get all upset. King Og, you believe in King Og, don't you? And all the other giants that said they were as tall as cedar trees? How tall is a cedar? Well, it's at least 20 feet. What's well, this guy would look like a shrimp to them. But these are all over the place. <clears throat> so I wrote a book called Giants Against Evolution to show that, okay, if these things are uh, uh, in the past, why are they so huge? Why are we, the six foot guys here, at the top of creation? When you got these people out here that are a f maybe a few feet tall up to guys that are 20, 30 feet tall, that would mess up the old monkey to man lineup. That's the problem. Besides that, everybody knows the story about, well, he used to, everybody knew the story about David and Goliath. And that is in the Bible. Well, if that's true, you know, we can't be putting these giant skeletons up because they want to be talking about the Bible. That's the reason we have the museum here, the American Museum of Natural History, is to disprove the Bible. So giants, giants are a huge problem for archeologists, the paleontologists and all that because they shouldn't be. So this guy here, this is us today. That's probably a, uh, a Comanche Indian, and uh, it might have been, I always thought he was six feet tall, but maybe he's more. This will be your ancestors. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but you know this whole ancestor thing? We, th we uh, have been told that people were so primitive and they finally came out of Africa and they learned to make a flint arrowhead and say, ugh. Well, it's so much different than that. The evidence is so different than that. And the further back you go, the smarter people were. This is called uh, Max Track from Glen Rose. Uh, Dr. Carl Ball and the team excavated them several years ago. This is the only one I know of that was molded. It's a little bit warped because the mother mold was probably not available when they molded it. But you know, this is no small guy here. And whether his heel ends here or there, it doesn't matter. Whether he's got five, six, or seven toes, it's a little undecided. He's a big man. People that were there said, yeah, we know those are real tracks, but they're too controversial. 
So what? Why not put them out there? People love, love people more than anything on earth. And giant people, little people, big people, weird people, we love people. So why not put these in the museums? Because they vindicate the Bible. There's all kinds of historical documentation of finding giants in the Americas and all over. And then once the Smithsonian and Vatican institutions like that show up, all of a sudden the evidence magically disappears. Well, why? Because it goes against the scientism model of evolution. They've got no place to fit giants in there. The Bible tells you exactly what happened, where the giants come from in Genesis 6. And in Numbers 13, they're encountering the giants in the land of Canaan. And uh, Joshua and the Israelites came into the land, and there was a, basically a giant holocaust, a holocaust of giants, and a diaspora of giants. They didn't get all of them. Uh, the ones they didn't get took off. And there's evidence of giants all over the world where they dispersed to. So um, you know, giants is just one of those things that proves the biblical narrative that scientism doesn't want to have anything to do with. One of the things that um, has gotten me a lot of trouble are these weird skulls here from Peru. So I'm doing shows about them on my YouTube channel called Forbidden Paleontology because Christians don't want me to work with it and the evolutionists don't. Except the alien guys, yes, they want because they want to say these are alien skulls. Problem is, this little gal here turned out to be Scotch. And she's in Peru 2,000 years ago. Go figure. <clears throat> so, but th these things are, um, a lot of these skulls are complex. Now, these, this one, this one, this one have only one parietal. You're supposed to have two. All right. But, now this guy here had two. But look how many extra bones he's got between his occipital and his parietals up here. He's got like 30 extra bones. So, are these primitive? Well, that's what they tell us, the poor old primitive Peruvians down there. Oh, really? So these little primitive guys down there that, uh, you know, lived in mud huts and all that, they made all those uh, stones over there at, at Sacsayhuaman, uh, Cusco, and Machu Picchu. Those little guys, they were primitive? Well, I, something's messed up here. As I continued to talk to Joe, I realized that the spiritual deception of scientism goes a lot further than I previously suspected. It was a deep, troubling thought I took away with me as I continued forward. I really, truly believe that most of all this science and the scientism that we've been taught is a war on creation. It's a war on how he constructed it. It seems like the uh, mainstream media, when it begins to push a scientific agenda, it consistently is leading people 180 degrees away from scripture and a personal relationship with our Creator. So having seen that pattern, I have now started to question virtually everything that they tell me I need to believe because it is inevitably leading me in a different direction than what I understand to be true from scripture. That is a big problem and it puts me in a position that's not advantageous in you know a secular world because once again we get back to the why is it not okay to ask questions people don't like that people want you to be they, they don't want you to go with the flow they don't want you swimming against the stream and anytime we question the high priests of our society aka these scientists we're fighting the stream we're fighting the current and it's it, it's difficult if i told you that i believe god created the heaven and the earth like the bible teaches you're going to say and where did god come from and i don't know but you said, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that either. We don't. Don't tell me my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, sir. They're both religious. Evolution is a religion. So you have to believe. So ask the professor, where did the matter come from? He said, I don't know. So basically, I believe in the beginning God and you believe in the beginning dirt. Most certainly it's the Darwinian, the whole premise that we evolved of monkeys. I mean, that in itself is ludicrous as well. And the fact that they teach that in our school systems, that's part of the educational curriculum, and that everybody is indoctrinated into such belief without second guessing or questioning or ever challenging the mindset of that belief, that, I mean, the sheer lunacy of all that, especially for those that are believers that understand that the Most High, God created us in His image and that we are a special creation and that the earth was created as a special place for our habitation. And so, in my opinion, the beginning of all that with the Darwinian, the We Evolved of Monkeys, that was a setup for, and it's all dependent upon 
what we're talking about now with regard to scientism and the deception of cosmology. Because if they didn't have all that in place with regard to the Copernican system and the whole Big Bang and how everything just randomly came about, that that was what evolved life here on the Earth. And that there's all these other planets, uh, that all the stars are suns, and that each one of them have uh, the possibility of evolving life in the same manner uh, that we find and see it replicated here on the Earth. All that, um, you know immediately that it's dependent upon the whole Big Bang cosmology and the establishment of uh, what is a counterfeit system, the replacement of the Earth as the geocentric center of the universe and as the focus, as the jewel of the creation established for us by God and that there's intelligent design behind the situation of all of these things and the establishment of it, um, that without the, the whole solar system, that the earth is moving in orbit around the sun, that we're part of a, nine planets, a part of a solar system, all of the Darwinian stuff could not have ever come about. Scientism as, is a spiritual deception because it's arguing against true spiritualism. And this whole topic of scientism really started rising up has been in the last couple of years. Really, I can't remember a time in my life outside of the creation scientists that really questioned science. And they did a, a really good job of disproving evolution. So why don't we take the same approach to cosmology? Scientism and the Earth. I had done, I had been doing my research on the occultic roots of NASA. I had already began to develop questions about uh, the amount of trust that I could apply to the research that had been presented through that organization. And I met a math professor and a physicist that were very much interested in geocentrism and ether research. And that was a foreign subject to me. I had no idea that anybody uh, believed that the sun could be what was moving and that the earth was stationary. Um, they began to tell me about uh, various uh, tests in the 60s and 70s that had supported this and how it was a topic that was very much valid. And so I began to grow interested in geocentrism. That is where I really started doing my first scriptural study on biblical cosmology. I believe it's hard for regular people to look into cosmology. What's one of the most predominant sayings that you've heard in n normal everyday life when it comes to classes or things that you have to learn? Well, it's not rocket science. You know, we've been taught that only the smartest of the smart can look into cosmology. And whenever people ask simple questions about how the earth works, how gravity works, we're told an endless string of numbers. Uh, what's written to us looks like it's in a foreign language. And we're told, well, it's just too complicated to explain to the average mind. And I have to ask myself, is it? Is it really too complicated to explain to the average mind? They've, they've set those subjects on a pedestal so far above the average person that we've been trained to believe that it's not even worth our time looking into because we wouldn't understand it even if we tried. That's a problem. Man, without being told we're on a spinning ball, would naturally assume, no, we're on a stationary earth and all that stuff's moving over us. I think that anybody that didn't read something somewhere or wasn't taught otherwise, that would be their only natural conclusion. So therefore, your natural conclusion without indoctrination would be that we are on a geocentric something. Everything's moving around us. We go to school, however, and we have the globe in the classroom. So that's all we see from day one. And they tell us, well, the reason everything that we perceive is moving is because we are the ones that are actually moving. So they're the ones that force a heliocentric model on us and force a, a paradigm upon us that's contrary to our senses. We have to be told, that's just your perspective. This is what's really happening. So being that we're taught that, and that's all we've known through school, I probably would never have questioned it had I not looked into the scriptures. When I looked into the scriptures and saw, it actually says the earth is not moving. <laughs> it's stationary, it's fixed. It's set on pillars, it has a foundation. Then. Looking at it from a biblical worldview, I can only go with a geocentric model. So now, all of a sudden, 
the biblical geocentric model fits my senses. The heliocentric model doesn't fit my senses. So, okay, look, you've proven that they lied to us about biology. You've proven that they lied to us about geology. You've proven they lied to us about archaeology and change and scrub the historical record. Why are you giving them a pass then on cosmology when it's the same people? It's the same group that have this scientism religion that gave us the cosmology that we believe in, and the cosmology that they're using is what made the other stuff even remotely plausible to begin with. And I don't think, I don't think there's any reason why we should trust the same people that are giving cosmology to us that gave us all these other stuff, that the creation ministries are doing such a great job in the churches. They're good with that, but they don't want to touch the cosmology side. The, the earth being the foundation, as Isaiah describes in chapter 40, verse 22, where he describes the firmament being the curtain that covers over the circle of the earth. And that as Amos also describes in chapter 9, verse 6, he describes where the Most High is seated upon his throne is connected to the earth through the firmament, and he calls it the vaulted dome of the earth. And that the firmament as a solid structure covers over and encapsulates the circle of the earth, the flat plane of the earth. Uh, in Proverbs, it describes it um, as a, a circle being inscribed upon the waters of the deep. Remember that it is the cosmology, the Darwinian heliocentric Copernican system, which deters people and distracts them from relationship with the Creator and with the creation. And so, it is, it is the foundation for the atheism that we see predominant in the world, that it has led more people astray and separated them from understanding the authority of the Word and that the Bible is truly the inerrant, divinely inspired Word of the Creator. Um, it has separated so many from that understanding and that even now in their adulthood they are caught up in the deception to such degree that they have no close relationship with the creator john robbie we're a little bit outside of uh, austin what uh, time is rob skiva getting there oh okay well we're gonna get rick and uh, rob um interviewed and we'd love to get you interviewed a little later in the evening we have time Okay, perfect. Well, we'll be at the conference probably in about, uh, I'd say about an hour. So yeah, we're getting ready now to head to the conference. And John Gabelson, the one that uh, is actually, you know, running the conference, he uh, came across my stuff and it was actually Scientism Exposed. This issue is becoming really big and it's going to be really awesome to get some great interviews. And like it cost a lot for us, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially. But it was the moment that I said, okay, Father, I'm just going to believe you, that everything that I was not getting in the worldly sense, in the sense of commerce, God was bringing. Just laying it on the heart of somebody, you know what, I, I feel like I got to give you a gift. And it just so have to be enough to pay the rent or pay this bill or pay that bill. And, and that's, I've been writing on that since then. And I'm like, every time I go to the P.O. box, at the exact moment when a need is there and it happens to present itself, and, and I walk in the post office and there's this guy in scrubs. And he's looking at me weird. I'm just dragging myself in there going, I just want to put a bullet in my head. I open the thing, pull out a thing, and there's a check in there. And he goes, are you Rob Skiba? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> He goes, man, you can't quit, dude. You can't quit. You can't stop. You know, there is a price to be paid. There is a cost to this. I see scientism as a religion. They have a belief system that they are starting with, and they're doing everything they can to force science into agreement with that belief system. And so when you've got this Copernican model type of, you know, evolutionary Big Bang theory, and, and that's coupled with uh, the, the writings of Isaac Newton. And they say, well, mass and gravity, there's all, there's all these things in the equations that have to be this way. And then they look at 
the way the cosmos, the way the universe, the way the galaxies are, and they're like, well, the galaxies should be, according to our own laws that we've established, should be flying apart. So now you're going to have this big explosion, and everything becomes perfectly organized. And when you ask them about it, they say, well, the, the, we can explain this based on probability theory, because if there's enough big explosions over a long enough period of time, over billions and billions of years, one of them will be the perfect explosion. And, and I say, so what you're telling me is if I blow a hurricane through a junkyard enough times, over billions and billions of years, eventually, after one of those hurricanes, there'll be a 747 fully loaded and ready to fly. There's all this stuff they can't account for, so they start making up ad hoc theories to explain away these problems and you come up with things like dark matter and dark energy but then you have people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and others saying well here's the you know four percent that we really understand or we think we understand about the cosmos but the other 96 percent we're 96 percent stupid and Michio Kaku says you know when it comes to cosmology you know we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120 this is the biggest mismatch you know, between science and reality, and I'm sitting there going, then why are we still calling this science? To me, it starts with people like Lyell. Stripes in the rock mean millions of years. Darwin says, well, that's cool, because I got this theory that we came from monkeys. Or they would correct you and say, well, it's really apes. Whatever, you know. But that's cool, because I need the millions of years to make that work. And then you got characters like Huxley that show up and say, okay, cool, I'll be your bulldog, and we'll, you know, promote all this stuff. Uh, and that's what you really see happening in the mid to late 1800s and going into the beginning of the 1900s. So they certainly stand out. But then when you get into the 1900s, I think you can make, a, or into the 20th century in general, I think people like Carl Sagan stand out. You know, uh, he was definitely the most vocal guy that I remember watching on TV, you know, Nova and whatever, all these shows, Cosmos, I forget the name of his show. Um, billions and billions of years ago. You know, I just always remember making fun of that guy because to him, it's like billions was everything. Billions, billions, trillions, trillion, million, 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 billion, four hundred billion suns. Billion, trillion, million, billion, trillions of orbiting snowballs. Billion, 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 trillions, million, 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 billion, 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 million, billion, 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 million, million, billion, 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 million, 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 billion, million, 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 billion, billion, four billion year old tree. and the universe. And yet in cosmology, they're by their own admission, they're 96% stupid and 10 to 120 off. That is a religious, religious belief system that they're trying to force uh, upon us in the guise of science. They're trying to use science as their vehicle to put it across. As a Christian, I use the Bible as my source book. They're trying to use science as their source book, but science today, and even in the time of Tesla, he was like, you know, scientists today have wandered off in equation after equation until they have something that looks nothing like reality. And you have William Shatner talking to some of these guys in interviews and realizes it, this stuff's all in their head. And, you know, I, I got to love it when you got Captain Kirk himself, right? William Shatner saying science and science fiction are the, they're the same. The mystery of science fiction is what I'm talking about. Science and science fiction are essentially the same. Thank you very much. How do, how do you prove a black hole? How do you know those gravitational waves proved the collision of two black holes? Somehow, eventually, they are able to observe phenomena. No, they that... can't observe. <laughs> It's too far away. It's too theoretical. How do we know what they're saying is true? And unfortunately, that's what it appears to be today, is that they've got math to try to fit everything that they've already believed. Whereas true science, that I think none of us are against true science. True science should be observable, testable, repeatable, you know, things that we can all go out and do for ourselves. You can't observe a star being born. You, you may get fortunate enough to see one that you think blew up, as it has been recorded in time. You know, they saw something in the sky and they imagined that it blew up. But can you repeat it? Can you test it? Can you, all you can do is make an assumption 
on your observation. And that's not really science. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather dazzled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. When I first made the correlations between Kabbalah and science, I was stunned. We do know that Isaac Newton had access to certain mystical texts, certain texts of the Kabbalah. Well, the Kabbalistic description of creation is coming from a single little point, from a speck, and of having matter form and time and space form all together at the very beginning. This sounds very much to me like the description of the Big Bang. I couldn't believe that the Kabbalists could derive these truths without really knowing any mathematics or physics. I believe that uh, science in of itself, not the true definition of science, but science itself, uh, the industry science, is completely at war with the truth. It is definitely uh, a spiritual thing because if you hide the truth from somebody, ultimately the truth is going to lead to God. I don't care what you pick. The second that you uh, go against the truth, you're going with the lie. And so it's teaching people to believe the lie early. The firmament was huge for me. And it, you, I, there are people out there trying to say it's just an expanse. And it just represents gas, air, atmosphere, and space. The words in English don't support that. The word in Hebrew doesn't support that. The word in Greek does not support that. And the way it's described doesn't support that. It says that the throne of God is sitting on top of this thing and it's attached to the earth. And you know, and it declares his handiwork, his being the creator. This is a huge deal. And you got, you, you got Isaiah, Yeshua, the son of God himself, Jesus Christ, if you prefer, Peter and John, four big, heavy hitters in scripture telling you that all the stars up there are going to fall to earth. And at that point I'm going, then they can't be what modern science is telling me they are. Because we got big problems if Betelgeuse is headed our way, followed by Andromeda and a few billion other galaxies. You know, so somebody's lying here. So am I going to call Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, and John a liar? Or am I going to call Carl Sagan, you know, Lawrence Krauss, Michio Kaku, and Neil deGrasse Tyson a liar? Well, these guys don't have any credibility in my eyes because they're always bashing the Bible. And by their own admission, they're telling you, excuse me, they're full of crap. By their own admission, they don't know what they're talking about. So why would I ever believe them over the scriptures? It was evident that this deception was massive in scope and scale. I was looking forward to meet a bright light, Pastor Dean Odell, a man who had a refreshingly hopeful perspective that brought together the truths of the Bible while exposing the lies of scientism when it comes to cosmology. It would be a visit I would never forget in a church in Alabama, meeting a man who had risked everything to present the truth. Hello. How are you today? Very good, I have a reservation for Mr. Davidson. Here are the smart men, here are the wise men, here are the PhDs, and what they say, they know more than you. So if they say there's a star 100 billion light years away with planets that could support life, okay, that science is observable, repeatable, and we, we call it science, therefore it's settled. And then I start finding out, you do a little digging, you find out, all they can see is a star twinkling. That's it, even with the best television, we see a star twinkling. If we go back to the Bible uh, about the true nature of creation, God said he made the heavens and the earth, right? So he said he made the earth, the dry land, the seas, and then he says he made the sun and the moon and the stars. He doesn't mention that he ever made any planets. This is a term that is completely foreign. There's one place that uses the word planets, but the, the Hebrew word is Maseroth, which means the constellation. So again, it's just a reference to the stars. And of course, the book of Jude and also the book of Enoch calls what we call Mars and Venus and Mercury, the planet, calls them wandering stars. So there's really, according to scripture, according to the Bible, they're just stars. There's the sun, there's the moon, there's the stars, that's it. Right, Megan. 
Yeah, sure Let's thing. get in out of this Alabama heat. Now, one of the hard things, we live in the information age. So we live with the internet and you can get good and bad. So one of the most difficult things is to filter through what is true, what is fake, what is, you know, deception, what's a hoax. So again, I think you've got to come back. You've got to have a foundational source of truth where I know this is true and I can filter all of these different voices through that. And I think for me, for you and, you know, true Christian, the Bible is that because we've, we've come to know it intimately over many years. And so, and like I said, all this, the evidence, the proof. So I can take the, the scriptures and I can go, okay, let's take the new world order. Okay, you say that's a conspiracy theory. But when I come to the Bible and I see where the Bible told me that thousands of years ago, that there's going to be an end time conspiracy of world leaders, then I tell people this all the time. I said, if it's in Bible prophecy, it's not a conspiracy theory. So we're coming into downtown Auburn, Alabama. Um, this is the home of Auburn University. One of the reasons we're taking a little trip down here is because um, just to you know, see the university is beautiful but uh, also because uh, Auburn has an unusual uh, connection to the space program, to NASA, because we've had uh, six astronauts uh, graduate from Auburn. So it's very, you know, I don't know how many universities in the country can say that, probably MIT and a few others, but still, um, you know, a little college here, a little town in, in the south in, in Alabama has six astronauts, and I believe they've all been on shuttle missions. And then what a lot of people don't know about Alabama is that there's the, the connection to the rocket program, the space program that Warner Von Braun lived in Huntsville. And that's basically where he developed the entire Saturn V, the whole rocket program. Well, Warner Von Braun, of course, was the uh, SS officer who developed the V-2 rockets for, um, for Hitler. And of course, Operation Paperclip, we got him and a bunch of other Nazi SS officers to come and start basically the MK Ultra program, uh, NASA, um, and then of course they worked with uh, Jack Parsons, the occultist, and Order of the Golden Dawn, and with Crowley and all that uh, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, I just find it interesting, it's really wild that Von Braun, you would think, out of anywhere in America, he, he would have ended up, an SS officer who's going to end up heading NASA, ends up in Alabama of all places, you know. So I spend time just on NASA's site going through their videos, their stuff, and then you see stuff and you're like, no way, this is at nasa.gov, you know? And one document now, one document that I have talked about, and I'm sure it's been, other people's had it in different videos, but the NASA document 1207 that talks about the derivation and definition of linear aircraft. And the whole thing, basically in the summary, it says, uh, it's talking about linear aircraft and basically how they're, you know, aircraft's built, and it says to fly over a non-rotating flat Earth, and and then it has all the math, all the calculus, trigonometry, and all the math about aerodynamics and airplanes and uh, all this stuff. And at the end, in the conclusion, it's like this is about this entire manual is about aircraft flying over a non-rotating flat earth. And I'm like, if a, if a non-rotating flat earth does not exist, why would you even use the phrase? Why would you even say that? Scientism and NASA. I find it very hard to believe that after having very limited technology in the 60s, traversing our way to the moon through various obstacles that still are not able to adequately be explained, that we no longer have the technology to do so. That being said, it's made me wonder if we ever had the technology to do so. When you listen to the lectures of the professionals at NASA, 
they seem to indicate that we don't traverse anything more than 400 miles. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to, and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. Well, how far did, what was the moon, 240 something thousand miles? You know, well, we can't, we can't go further than that anymore. It doesn't make sense. As a kid, I saw Star Wars when I was seven years old. And I don't know too many kids that didn't freak out, especially in my generation. When they saw that movie, man, they either wanted to get in space or they wanted to be a, you know, an actor or whatever. But we all played Star Wars. We all grew up on Star Trek. We loved space. And NASA was the vehicle to take us there. NASA's the precursor to Starfleet, you know. Uh, you know, from, from that kind of mindset that we grew up with, Star Trek is meant to be like, this is Earth's future a few hundred years from now. So the writers of Star Trek, you know, basically say, this is where we are today, let's extrapolate that into the future, and then you got the fiction there. But, I mean, you can see how Star Trek has itself impacted NASA. You can see how science fiction in general has impacted NASA. Arthur C. Clarke is the one that came up with satellites, Actually, you could argue Leonardo da Vinci or some of these other guys, you can go even back to, you know, Newton back in that time frame, coming up with ideas of shooting a cannonball. You know, if you shoot it the right trajectory or whatever, it would just continually fall around the globe. You know, that kind of thing. So NASA is the vehicle to take us to space. I was one month old, sitting on my mother's lap. I was born June 26, 1969, July 20th, you know, barely a month later. I'm watching blurry images on a, color, a black and white TV that my dad actually took pictures of. I have the scrapbook at home of the photos from the TV of man allegedly walking on the moon. Good day from ABC Space Headquarters in New York. It is July 20th, 1969, and man is about to land on the moon. But we never really questioned it. At least I didn't. I don't know anybody in, in, in the, of the people that I knew that ever really should we really trust NASA? But then eventually I decided to finally look into it for myself. And there are lots of problems with the moon landing. And for one thing, Orion is the new project that replaced the space shuttles. Orion is supposed to be, you know, this is the new big, you know, the pinnacle of our technology. And they're like, well, we can't go anywhere yet till we figure out how to get through the Van Allen radiation belts. And you're kind of like, wait a minute. Why don't you just do the same thing in the 60s and 70s? When you went through that thing, you know, several times there and back in a tin can and jumpsuits. And by the way, if those jumpsuits are so great, why don't you go clean up Fukushima? You know, or any place else where we've got radiation problems. Well, they can't do it because that stuff's not what we were told it is. And so when you have NASA themselves telling you, hey, we can't get through the radiation, we've got a problem with radiation. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation telemetry we lost all that information everything all the technology that we that, that we were able to supposedly use to get to the moon we can we, we did we, we don't have anymore i'd go to the moon in a nanosecond uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore we used to but we uh destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again I haven't uh, seen anything that indicates the telemetry data is even in existence, and as I said, even if we had it, we don't have the machines to play it back. We, we've been unable to, to, to track it down. I mean, we don't know uh, where this, this telemetry data ended up, and we don't know the, what, what path it may have taken. So <laughs> unfortunately, I'm afraid I can't really give you much of a clue as to, as to where this data ended up and whether it, it still exists or not. There's no reason for me to believe them anymore, you know? And so I don't. They're always putting out something, but it's always CGI, you know? Show me a picture of a satellite, a photograph of a satellite in orbit, you know? But the sad part is that even if they did that, it'd be hard to tell if it, nowadays with the technology that we have in, in 3D graphics and things like that, it's gonna be hard to tell. You know, we're at that point now. But throughout the 70s, or 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, looking back now, it's easy to tell what is just ridiculous attempts at CGI. There's no reason to believe NASA for anything, you know, and there's every reason to question them about everything.
What is our next destination for America in space? The next destination for America in space, and I'm not being trite when I answer this, is the International Space Station. We've got to get there four more times this year. Uh, the big, the long-term destination, after we successfully close out the space shuttle program, uh, the ultimate destination is Mars. And there are intermediate points that we are going to have to get to before we are capable of going to Mars. If you gave me all the money in the federal budget today, I could not get a human to Mars. I could not morally put a human in a spacecraft and launch them on an eight-month mission to Mars because I do not understand the radiation. All right, so what is our next destination in space? The next ultimate destination is... No, the next one. Congressman, the next destination, as I said before, is the International Space Station. And All we've right, got let's to do that not be trite, right, then. What is the one after that? It's Mars. So there's nothing in between, as far as you're concerned. But there are intermediate stops What are the they? There. What's the next one? The moon is a, is a destination. Lagrange points are destinations. Which one is next? You mean where do we go immediately next? Is that, is that the question? That's what next means. I think that questioning scientism and looking into what we perceive as possible lies is important because the day that we're no longer able to ask questions is the day that George Orwell's 1984 is no longer fiction. Adam, uh, tell us about the landing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg. Um, I can't tell you too much about it. It looked good, in short. Good and clean. And, and it looks, at least by my eyeball, that we uh, landed in a nice, flat spot. Beautiful. <laughs> really beautiful. Shani Jardin from boingboing.net, and I'm going to stand in for Miles O'Brien with PBS NewsHour tonight. What you kind look more attractive than Miles. <laughs> I won't tell him that, Adam. Okay. I think he heard it. it. What? I, I have to ask you, what kind of file type? Can you tell us about the image file type and compression that was used to send this very important uh, couple of thumbnails back from Mars? Yes. Unfortunately, I absolutely cannot. <laughs> <laughs> if Justin Mackey is in the room, or there's a couple other people on the team who'd be able to whip that out quickly, but I, I don't, couldn't tell you. Sorry. Really? You know, and then when they start sending you pictures of Pluto that happen to look like Pluto, the Disney character, you're like, somebody's just laughing at us at this point. And they're beaming us back photos from how many millions of miles away? And yet I have trouble ha keeping a Wi-Fi signal in the hotel? How are you getting that Wi-Fi signal of pictures emailed to us from freaking Pluto not just through that massive distance, but also through the Van Allen radiation belt. And presumably there's more radiation beyond the belt because that belt's supposedly there to protect us from the other stuff. Go to the root. Anytime somebody says, hey, uh, you know, what about this? Well, how did it start? How did NASA start? Find out who started NASA. You know, who were the official members of NASA at the beginning? Why did they get it going? It seems obvious to me that even the names of all of their programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, uh, the names of their space shuttles, uh, Endeavor and uh, Columbia, that they all have occultic meaning to them and that they all show uh, the pagan, the pantheon of the gods and goddesses as it was worshipped by the secret societies going back thousands of years. And again, when you look at the even the Jesuit priests that put forth the premise of the Big Bang and Copernican and others, they were associated with the Jesuit, the Freemasonic conspiracy. And so in my opinion, it absolutely has roots that NASA has occultic roots um, with even Jack Parsons, JPL, Aleister Crowley, L. Ron Hubbard, they all have connections to occultism and to these pagan theologies. And, and yeah, looking into and examining it, it's undeniable that the roots of NASA are most certainly um, contained within and fabricated from uh, such conspiracy. Big Bang cosmology, in, in my mind, is what made it possible 
It may, it's what made evolution even remotely plausible. And if evolution is remotely plausible because of the Big Bang, then ipso facto, it could have happened elsewhere. That's the whole idea, is the conditions were right, that our Earth spun off into a perfect orbit at the right Goldilocks distance from our sun and the size and age of our sun, that we're in the perfect zone that life was made possible. And if that could happen here, it stands the reason, the odds are, if there are all those zillions of stars out there also have planets around them, then very likely other worlds could have evolved some form of life in a similar fashion. Okay, well, now that they've realized that intelligent design is real, when they look at them in the microscopic level, this isn't possible. There's too much intricate design here to have happened by random chance. So there was an intelligence behind this, but we've already ruled out God. We don't believe in God. So it must have been an ancient scientist that made this happen. So therefore, those ancient scientists who initially created this Petri dish that is Earth may come back to visit us. That's the narrative. So you have a massive increase in UFO activity. Along with that, you have a massive increase in documented cases of people claiming to be abducted by some sort of non-human entity, taking them into a laboratory environment and doing sexual experimentation on them. UFOs are obviously some kind of vehicle coming from elsewhere, so stands to reason in that scientism paradigm, it came from another planet. Could they be of the, the ones that it created the experiment that made us be what we are today in the first place? What I see in the future, it's, it seems like the writing's on the wall. Something, an event's going to happen. Independence Day style, you know, maybe wiping us out or maybe just showing up and saying, hey guys, we're your creators, we're back. Wow, look what you guys, you know kids, you've really kind of messed this place up. We're gonna have to clean it up, we'll help you out. And you know, maybe shows like V had it right. You know, where these alien entities show up, claiming to be our creators, offering mankind all kinds of benefits. Let's clean, let's give you clean energy. Let's eradicate cancer and disease and you're gonna live 500 years, you know, easy. All that's all wonderful. Oh, by the way, we have an enemy. We believe he's on his way. Now that we've helped you guys out, will you help us against him? Then you find yourself in a Revelation 19, 19 scenario where the armies of the world are gathered together to make war with the one who's gonna be coming on that white horse. You read Psalm 2, the nations of the world conspiring together to make war with God. This is in the prophetic biblical narrative. That's already written in there. The world is gonna to gather together to make war with God. In my mind, the setup has already been in place for hundreds of years, but definitely within the last several decades of our lifetime, this ancient alien narrative is being put in our face. Scientism and the alien agenda. You find these shock patterns and you find the minerals from Mars. So it is not crazy, it's extraordinary, but not crazy to suggest that Mars was hit with an impactor through what's generally called a Hohmann orbit, an orbit where it goes falls toward the sun but ends up on the Earth. You and I are descendants of Martians. Okay, that and, that's not, crazy. and that's not crazy? Is it crazy that you and I are descendants of Adam and Eve? Uh, we are descendants from a common ancestor. I don't but know is, that it crazy that, is it crazy that God made the first man and woman and we're descendants there's, of them? For me, there's no evidence of that. So is that crazy? But I, I wouldn't use that word. It's, what would you say? It's a, um, you're betraying your intellect. You're not oh. using your head. So, it, so you're saying it is crazy? It's, just, it's frustrating. Which is frustrating. more crazy but, though. But you're saying we're descendants of Martians and that's it's, not crazy? I say it is not crazy. It's extraordinary, but not crazy. Okay, and so we have a process so where by the, which we can prove that. Uh, uh, prove, That's what's so oh, exciting. Oh, prove that we're just. I, Bill, I want, to, I want you to do that for all these young people. Prove that we're descendants from Martians. I can't prove that right now. I, I thought you said you were we, the I, last minute and a half. I thought you said we, we could. We want to send s spacecraft there. Okay. We have a process by which we can make this discovery. Okay. 
And it could be on Europa. There might be something alive. What if there is no discovery? Well, that's also extraordinary. Anything. That makes us even more unusual in the universe. Are, are you prepared to take... We have a book called the Bible that says it is the Word of God who made all things. You said, here's what happened in the past. Are you prepared to take that and consider it in regard to the evidence you see in the present? So I claim, Mr. Hamm, that I spent a lot of time on it. That I you, read it twice. Uh -huh. I followed the guys around on the maps. Uh -huh. I decided that humans made the whole thing up. And, you know, you think about NASA astronauts like Mitchell and Cooper and some of these others who've come out, and even Buzz Aldrin did, come out and said, oh yes, we saw UFOs, we believe that uh, alien life exists. Well, you know, these guys are supposed to be under top secret, you know, security clearances stuff. There's things that they're not supposed to talk about. Yet, these astronauts have come out with that, and there's been no penalty and no problems. I believe that that's part of the agenda that they're gonna take us down these roads. If they didn't want the astronauts to leak that they've seen UFOs and things like that, it w they wouldn't be talking about it because they put them in prison. You know, I mean, nobody would hear from them again. So they want the leaks. It's, it's just a, again, it's cat and mouse because they're eventually gonna say, yeah, yeah, we've been hiding this from you. Here's the total disclosure of it all. And uh, you know, that day's coming. The day of disclosure is, is coming and I believe it's going to cause many many people are going to fall. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says that there will be a strong delusion in the end, a very strong. Now think about it, we already deal with all kinds of deceptions but in the end he said there's going to be a very very strong delusion surrounding the Antichrist, surrounding the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, that the del there's going to be such a strong delusion that those who do not absolutely love the truth of the Word of God are going to fall for it hook, line, and sinker. All of this is leaning to something that we as culture and as world are dealing with now. And that's the plausibility that the so-called ancient aliens are our creators. And in my opinion, this is what scripture tells us as being the end game for scientism. That the Darwinian the Copernican, the heliocentric system, the model of all that they are teaching us with regard to this mindset, it is in my opinion connected to the coming forth of the Antichrist and that the Antichrist is what is being brought out of this counterfeit system and that our belief that God did not create us uh, and that as they teach in the educational systems, that, well, now with the History Channel and the Ancient Alien series, they are postulating and putting forth the premise that the ancient aliens, an extraterrestrial god, that these are the real gods of pagan cultures worldwide and that somehow long ago they came here, they seated us, and they left, but that they are returning. According to the Mayan, you know, the, prof the prophecies left in all the different pagan cultures. And so this is the next step of what we see as the strong delusion. I believe that what Satan had to start with was he had to set up the heliocentric model. He had to set that up. That the, it basically is two phases of the great deception. And I believe the first one was destroy uh, biblical cosmology, create one that gives you infinite space and infinite possibilities of life and then the final stage of the great deception is the alien deception. We have to send up more Kepler satellites. We have to eavesdrop on conversations in outer space between alien civilizations. This is something that we haven't even done yet. We have yet to find a single advanced civilization or life in outer space. But sooner or later, we will. Now, uh, I'm wondering if there can't be an upside to all this. I'm a big fan of the original Star Trek series, and it was only when, uh, you know, there were alien civilizations that seemed to uh, challenge the Earth that you found that the Earth got its act together for the kind of global governance that all the, uh, you know, all the visionaries say we need that if we're going to deal with climate change, if we're going to deal with all the, uh, all the modern issues, global finance, where the, our, our, the sovereignty of individual nations is actually a political barrier to solving these big problems. So can there be an upside to the alien threat? 
Believe it or not, when President Ronald Reagan met Mikhail Gorbachev, we now know during the transcripts of the meeting that he said that if we were ever attacked by the Martians, you and me, the Soviets and the capitalist U.S., would be allies in the fight against the Martians. Well, that's how Ronald Reagan looked at it, and believe it or not, there's some truth to it. If we are faced with a common enemy in outer space, it would indeed help to unite the Earth just the way Ronald Reagan said. You know, Romans 1 talks about men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Well, the word hold in the Greek means that they suppress or hold it down. There is a dark, occult, spiritual side to this whole alien agenda. But again, we see them connecting it to Antarctica. Scientism and the ends of the earth. There's an ice ring, a wall that holds in uh, the oceans that God said, you know, in Job 26.10 that he compassed or put a circle around the waters uh, to make a boundary. If so, and according to the Bible, there is a place that boundary is called the ends of the earth. Amos 9 where it talks about he made his vault of the heavens and he literally comes down and he says he, he bound it or he attached it to the earth. Enoch talks about this, and I have the quote from Enoch where he said, God took him and showed him where the, the vault of heaven came down and met the earth. Um, so I believe when the Bible talks about the ends of the earth, that we're talking about this, this boundary called Antarctica. This stuff is amazing, you know. People go down there and all of a sudden everybody decides to, oh, we need an Antarctic treaty. So people pull out of there and they all get into, into this room that has like a tr triangle, you know, pyramid looking thing there. And they sign this document, this Antarctic treaty, saying nobody can go back down there except under the express guidelines of this treaty. And then immediately after that, in the same time period, with Operation Deep Freeze in 56 time, 57 that time period, they pull out of there, Admiral Byrd dies, NASA's created in 58, DARPA's created in 58, Antarctic Treaty is, I believe, signed in 61. And in 62, you have the United States and Russia sending high-altitude nuclear bombs into the sky. <laughs> and the United States calls our part in that Operation Fishbowl part of a larger project called Operation or, or Project Dominic. Well, if you look up the name Dominic, what does the name Dominic mean? It means of the Lord. So the United States called their high-altitude nuclear bomb test Fishbowl of the Lord after coming back from Antarctica. Johnston Island was the center of launch and experimental activity for the 1962 high-altitude weapon effects testing termed Operation Fishbowl. At the northwestern end of the island was the Thor launch complex, joined later by Nike Hercules and Stripey units, plus a second Thor pad. On Operation Fishbowl, nuclear detonations went the sky five times. Now, if they're trying to avoid a conspiracy, they're not helping with the names. Additional construction on Johnston Island during this interim, as well as the scheduling of more shots, reflected the value attached to the testing being carried out on Operation Dominic. Three more high-altitude effects missile events were added to secure data at different heights. Also, five more over-ocean airdrops were scheduled, these to take place within the Johnston Island danger area. Besides a second Thor launch pad, the construction included facilities for the launch of XM-33 rockets and Nike Hercules missiles. All remaining launches culminated in detonation at their planned altitudes. First came Checkmate, boosted to altitude by a Sergeant-engined XM-33 rocket. It looks like maybe they found something there in Antarctica, they being the nations that de decided, hey, we need a treaty. So therefore, one of the things say, well, Okay, what's the motivation? Well, if this is true, that they found something down there that is contrary to the scientism model, the Copernican model, if you will, then they've got a, a lot of lying to cover up. Why did they all of a sudden, immediately, want to find out what's out there and at the same time, let's send nuclear bombs into the sky? I'm asking questions. It looks very suspicious to me. And it's, it tells me that if, if that is true, we're in an enclosed world, and they figured that out. 
then their motivation is A, to protect themselves, to, to hide that fact from us because of all the other lies they've been telling us for 500 years. And B, they have no vested interest in the whole world turning to God. So effectively, they would be hiding God. And this is what I have encountered with my entire journey on Scientism Exposed 2. I must confess, I found my fact-finding mission as enlightening as it was disturbing and at times even maddening. So I felt it was fitting to conclude it by visiting a small church in Alabama, where Pastor Dean Odell would help me to keep the battle for the truth in proper perspective. As Pastor Odell presented a sermon about the lies of scientism, he brought it around to the true creator of creation. This is what is most important, that people realize that with all the lies they are being taught by mainstream science, by all the agencies and education systems that they have been completely hoodwinked, and that they are being used by spiritual forces to draw people further away from God. But the fact remains, we were created. We are unique. We are special. We are loved. In the face of scientism, it is these truths we hold dear. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for Robbie and Justin getting them here safely. We thank you, God, for the work they're doing, for the ministry, Lord, to, to get the truth of the gospel, the truth of creation out to a group of people, Lord, a lot of them that would never even go to church at this point. Lord, we just thank you for that. We ask you to bless them, to bless scientism exposed. Father, we just pray for your anointing and your power upon uh, the whole process, the editing process they're going to have to go through. And Lord, we just ask you to bless it. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, to put your angels around them and around us, be a shield and a protection, touch everyone. And especially if there's lost people, convict them, convince them, draw them to faith in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Salvation from Scientism The Pope would like you to accept evolution and the Big Bang. The Pope! I mean, what, I, you know, I have people, you know, I get the hate mail all the time, you know. But there's, you, you, there's no way you dance around this. I don't care if you're a staunch Roman Catholic. You can't dance around this right here. The Roman Catholic Church is pro-evolution and Big Bang. Of course, with a twist, because that's what they want to say. Is, oh, oh, but it doesn't mean we don't believe in God. We believe that God caused the process of evolution or caused the Big Bang. But that's not what the Bible teaches. So what he's saying is, we believe the theories of scientism above what scripture says. Vast cosmic deceptions. Another way of saying religion is worldview. The whole of reality. The evolutionary worldview applies not only to the evolution of life or the origin of life, but even to that of the entire universe. In the realm of, of cosmic evolution, our naturalistic scientists depart even further from experimental science than life scientists do, manufacturing a variety of evolutionary cosmologies from esoteric mathematics and metaphysical speculation. Sociologist Jeremy Rifkin has commented on this remarkable game. He says, cosmologies are made up of small snippets of physical reality that have been remodeled by society into vast cosmic deceptions. So it goes everywhere. Do you get your cosmology from the Bible and what you can observe, or do you get it from these people? Who admit it is a religion, it is a belief system, it is esoteric philosophy. See, isn't it amazing that the whole world, because they don't want to believe in God, because they don't want to be accountable for their sins, they don't want to believe in God, they don't run to, they hate the light because the light exposes the sins in our heart. We don't want to feel guilt and shame. But you know, you've got to be able to feel that to know you have a need for a savior. If, if, if you didn't know, if, if you weren't convinced by a doctor, say you went to a doctor and you were diagnosed with cancer. If you were not convinced of the diagnosis, you would never take the cure. You have to be convinced. And until you are convinced that you are a sinner, 
that you have broken the laws of God, you have broken the commands of God, you have offended a holy God, the holy creator, and you feel that guilt and you feel that shame and you accept that reality, that's when you can say, I need to find this creator. I need to find this God. I need to see if there is love, if there is forgiveness, if there is redemption. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came, God in the flesh came, died on the cross for our sins, made a way for forgiveness, redemption, restoration, that God himself doesn't want any to perish. None, zero. God doesn't desire anyone to perish or, or go to hell or be separated from him. He doesn't desire that. He just desires repentance. And what does the word repentance mean? It, in, in the Greek, it means to feel compunction. That it means to feel the weight of your guilt enough that you're willing to change the way you think, the way you believe, the way you act. And repentance toward the Lord Jesus Christ brings the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus comes and washes your sins away. And it's a free gift. You don't have to do it through this church. You don't have to do it through the Roman Catholic Church. You don't have to do it through anybody. You can get down on your knees at any point, any time, and say, God, I believe. But I'm going to close with this. Whether it's creation, salvation, or the end of the age, the only book that has it all right, that got it all right ahead of time, is this book, the Bible, Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Revelation. It is the inspired, infallible word of Almighty God, Yahweh, the Creator. You want truth, truthers? It's in here. Don't believe the zeitgeist lie and all that other foolishness. Everybody, the devil's attacked the Bible for centuries. It's still here and it's still proven to be true. Amen? And I will not be ashamed. I will not be ashamed of what it says about creation, about the origin of man, the origin of life. I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ being the only way to heaven and salvation. I will not be ashamed to say that yes, the God of creation is going to return here and those who persist in stubbornness and wickedness and evil will be judged. And there is a heaven and there is a hell and there is an eternity and there is a kingdom coming that will be eternal and that kingdom is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and every other kingdom will be put under his feet. And that is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, amen? I think biblical cosmology is important because it's in the Word of God and everything from front to back in his Word is important or he wouldn't have put it in there. We are a sliver of a sliver among the population even now that is seeing the deception, the global deception, and how far-reaching it is. It, it's been kind of it, just an interesting ride. That's an understatement. Reading, reading scripture, um, it just it brings so many things to light. I mean, it just makes it so different. And even just driving around and looking at the the blue sky. Um, it just makes you feel closer to God. It just, it just brings everything just out. And um, it just makes you feel closer to God. Lord, you are worthy You've got to question, question everything. I mean, that's what they want you, that's what they want to teach you in college anyway. But then they won't let you question. So question what the professors teach. Question what your teachers teach. You know, look into what is real, what you can see and observe, and just don't take their word for it. I mean, that's, that's where we have all gotten so off, is we just, we take the word of our teachers. We take the word of, you know, our pastors and 
people around us over what we can actually observe and see or read in the Bible. I mean, it's just the danger of scientism is paramount to people understanding how bad it is. You know, it's just, there's no, there's nothing more dangerous than scientism. You can't be afraid to tell the truth. You can't be afraid to expose the lies. I mean, if we don't expose, if people aren't out to tell the truth, do you know how far this is gonna go? Look how far it's already gone. I didn't see that on the internet. I didn't see that on a video. I didn't see Jaron do it, or Rob Skiba do it, or Robbie Davidson. I did it. I saw it with mine. So doing your own study, your own research. Anytime somebody this day and age tells you you are not allowed to ask questions, that is the time that you need to start asking questions. But then if you can, can get them questioning science and scientism, you have a whole opportunity to share the true creator and the true gift that we have. To me, that is the most important of all of this, is what it leads to. And to me, that's why I think we, those of us who are believers and followers uh, of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, we need to follow, we need to be faithful, we need to trust that what He says is true and then go out and tell others. To me, that's the most important thing. And this is just one conduit that we can do to share people the truth. The issue we must address are these lies of scientism. These lies that of evolution, of the heliocentric view, uh, the lies of NASA, and all of these other, these are the lies that are turning a generation and turning so, and have already turned many people away from their knowing their creator, the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus. I was made inside his image with these features on my face. Uh, Meet me at a line of scrimmage if you feel like a debate. Yeah. Bring your books and charge, propaganda by the stack. But I'm bringing fossil evidence of dinosaurs intact. intact. Buried with the human race of people in a grave. With the illustrations saved inside a thousand year old cave. Yeah. Six thousand years, the planet has been here. Not a trillion, billion, hundred thousand that you hear. Man made mistakes and now the science isn't clear. But still they want to say that this is truth and not the fear. They say we came from apes. I'm asking this of you. Where's the missing link with fossil evidence to prove museums it. like the lion rig up dummies at a pace put a creature on display and say that they have solved the case oh. evolution is religion it's a fact that i'm a state because yeah. believing in this system man you gotta walk by faith hey man let's make one thing clear evolution is a religion man it takes an extreme amount of faith to believe that nothing came from something that that little something that created in the big bang is what we see here today come on man yeah, they want to call it science, but it's pseudoscience. Intellectual defiance, man, it's pseudoscience. Your monkey's no match for the lion from Zion. We're not in compliance, refusing to buy into the pseudoscience. They want to call it science, but it's pseudoscience. Intellectual defiance, man, it's pseudoscience. Your monkey's no match for the lion from Zion. We're not in compliance, refusing to buy into the pseudoscience. Yeah, they want to call it science, but it's pseudoscience. Intellectual defiance, man, it's pseudoscience. Your monkey's no match for the lion from Zion. We're not in compliance, refusing to buy into the pseudoscience. Christians are going to have to stop. And I'm telling you, we're going to have to stop submitting to this antichrist system, to this evil system. I'm talking about in the medical, in the pharmaceutical, in every realm. Just because they call it science does not mean it's right or it's ethical or it's even true. We gotta wake up. But so many people just accept it. Oh, recent scientists say, a recent study says, NASA says, and you're like, okay, I believe it because they said it. Well, if you just believe it because they said it and you can't prove it and you have no evidence, then you are walking in faith. impulses are being redirected.
We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. They have us! They control us! They are our masters! Wake up! The movement was begun eight months ago by a small group of scientists who discovered, quite by accident, the signals being sent through time. Questioning authority is an opposition defiant disorder. Do not question us because we know what's best for you. Do not listen to anyone who tells you to think otherwise. Do not listen to anyone else but us. We know the facts and everything we tell you is a fact.